Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Hi there students and welcome back to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. My name is Crystal Mardukanes. Nurse Educator, Teaching Medical and Surgical Nursing. As continuation to our discussion on gas exchange and respiratory function, we have airway management. Adequate ventilation depends on free movement of air through the upper and lower airways. In many disorders, the airway becomes narrowed or blocked as a result of disease. Bronchoconstriction or narrowing of the airway by contraction of muscle fibers, a foreign body, or secretions. Maintaining a patent or open airway is achieved through meticulous airway management, whether in an emergency situation such as airway obstruction or in a long-term management as in caring for a patient with an endotracheal or a tracheostomy tube. So we have here the airway management. So airway can be managed through emergency management of upper airway obstruction. It can also be managed through endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. For your emergency management of upper airway obstruction, Upper airway obstruction has a variety of causes. Acute upper airway obstruction may be caused by food particles, vomitus, blood clots, or anything that obstructs the larynx or trachea. It also may occur from the enlargement of tissue in the wall of the airway, as in epiglottis, obstructive sleep apnea, sorry, as in epiglottitis, obstructive sleep apnea, laryngeal edema, laryngeal carcinoma, or peritonsillar abscess, or from thick secretions. As a nurse, we have to conduct the following rapid observations to assess for signs and symptoms of upper airway obstructions, such as inspection, palpation, and auscultation. We also have your endotracheal intubation. It involves passing an endotracheal tube through the mouth or nose into the trachea. And it provides a patent airway when the patient is having respiratory distress. So your endotracheal tube, which is used during the endotracheal intubation, serves as the artificial airway for patients who are experiencing respiratory distress or difficulties. And it is the method of choice in emergency care. We also have a term called tracheotomy. It is a surgical procedure in which an opening is made into the trachea. We also have tracheostomy. This is the stoma that is the product of tracheotomy and it may be temporary or permanent. So as you could see here in the picture, that surgical incision in the trachea in order to make an opening that is called your tracheotomy, okay? And the stoma that uh, is created because of that surgical procedure is called the tracheostomy okay so this is done in order to uh, to have a, an airway access to the upper airway okay we also have complications first is bleeding second is pneumothorax Third is air embolism, okay? 
Aspiration, the patient might be aspirated. Patient might develop subcutaneous or mediastinal emphysema. Laryngeal nerve damage. Okay, the, the laryngeal nerve might be damaged because of the surgical procedure. We also have the posterior tracheal wall penetration. Okay, so uh, the tracheal wall might be uh, affected if it is mistakenly done during the uh, surgical procedure. We also have the nursing management. Continuous monitoring and assessment is very important if the patient has tracheostomy. Opening kept, pat, uh, kept patent by proper suctioning of secretions. So it's very important that if your patient has a trache uh, tracheostomy or an endotracheal tube, it is a must to suction the patient okay, as needed. In order for the airway to be cleared up with possible secretions that might obstruct the airway. And also we have to position the patient in semi fowler's position. This could help expand the lungs and thus increasing the breathing mechanism of the respiratory system. Also, we have to provide the patient with paper and pencil as a means of communication. Okay? So remember, if your patient has an endotracheal tube, he or she cannot speak. So in order to communicate to his or her healthcare providers, such as, your, such as the doctor, or maybe to the nurse or to the uh, family of the patient, you must provide a paper and pencil and pencil for him or her to write everything that he or she wants to tell you okay now let's proceed to the suctioning of the endotracheal or the tracheal tube so for tracheostomy or endotracheal tube so by the way, when we say tracheostomy, that means it's the opening uh, made going to uh, made on the trachea. Okay. When we say endotracheal tube, that means an endotracheal tube is being inserted through the mouth going to the airway. Okay. So that's the difference between the two. But regardless, they need to be they need to be suctioned as needed okay in order to prevent obstruction so it is performed when adventitious breath sounds are detected or whenever there are secretions and it must be sterile to prevent asepsis or infection in the lower airway so in performing suctioning you should use or perform this procedure with uh, with a septic technique okay that means you will use sterile materials here since you are introducing that uh, suction tip to the airway we also have an inline suctioning it is also known as your closed suctioning it allows the patient to be suctioned without being disconnected from the ventilator circuit. And it can be performed without PPE. Okay? So your inline suctioning is a built-in suctioning which is uh, already attached to the tubings of your mechanical ventilator. So the nurse should only click or should only press the suction valve in order for to, in order for the machine to suction the secretions from the patient and it is uh, and it will end it is no longer a manual insertion of the suction tip it is already there so if the patient has an increased secretion for example in his or her airway so the nurse will just 
press the suction valve and it will gather or it will suction the secretions from the patient okay so having said that there is no uh you should uh, you are not uh required to wear a any ppe or complete ppe okay for for that procedure so this is an example of your inline suctioning so as you notice we have your endotracheal tube and we have the tube or corrugated tube going to the mechanical ventilate ventilator and at the distal end of your endotracheal tube you have you have your suction tip okay so it's already there attached on the uh, ET tube so the nurse will just press the suction valve in order to suck or suction the secretions from the patient okay without introducing the suction tip manually to the endotracheal tube so it's built in so how do we manage the cuff of your endotracheal tube so as you can see here in the picture we have your endotracheal tube with in inflated cuff okay Ah, uh, sorry with a uh, inflated balloon okay so the blue one is the cuff so there you in that uh, piece of device you will introduce air there by the use of syringe in order for the balloon to be inflated so the cuff on the ET or the tracheostomy should be inflated if in the uh, mechanical ventilator or high risk for aspiration the purpose of inflating the cuff is that it helps in anchoring the endotracheal tube so that it will not be dislodged from the patient okay so that means we have to administer the correct pressure of air so that it could properly anchor uh, in the airway too much of air or too much pressure on that balloon or on that cuff would result to problems okay it would compress the walls of your airway causing uh, damage also if it's too so if it's uh, not inflated well so dislodgement of that endotracheal tube will occur so we should maintain at less than 25 millimeters of mercury to prevent injury okay so the millimeters mercury there is the unit of measurement for pressure okay and more than 15 millimeters of mercury to prevent aspiration okay and it is monitored at least every eight hours okay so basically every shift if you have an eight hour shift in the hospital so you have to monitor it at least once per shift okay just to make sure that there is still enough or correct amount of uh, pressure on the cuff okay so in the hospital for an adult uh, patient we usually inject 10 ml of air okay so that would be enough to anchor the ET tube on the patient's airway now let's proceed to your mechanical ventilation it is a positive or negative pressure breathing device that can maintain ventilation and oxygen delivery for a prolonged period it may be required for a variety of reasons first is to control patients respirations during surgery or treatment second is to oxygenate the blood when the patient's ventilatory efforts are inadequate and lastly to rest the respiratory muscles okay so your mechanical ventilator serves as an artificial airway for the patients okay so these are the three reasons that we administer or that we give 
patient's mechanical ventilations. For the indication, so it is indicated for those patients who has for who have respiratory failure and compromised airway. Patient who requires ET tube or ET intubation. All, all, and also patients who needs or who need mechanical ventilation. So let's now proceed the different classification of your ventilators. So it is categorized into negative pressure ventilators and positive pressure ventilators. Negative pressure ventilators. It is an older modes of the ventilatory support that are rarely, uh, rarely utilized today. So we no longer use these negative pressure ventilators. Now let's have your positive pressure ventilators. Inflate the lungs by exerting positive pressure on the airway, pushing air in, forcing the alveoli to expand during inspiration. So we have four types of your positive pressure ventilators. We have your volume cycle ventilators, pressured cycle ventilators, high frequency oscillatory support ventilators, and non-invasive positive pressure ventilator. For your volume cycled ventilators, it delivers a preset volume of air with each inspiration. So once the present the preset, sorry, the preset volume is delivered to the patient, the ventilator cycles off and exhaling occurs passively. So that means when we say volume cycled ventilators, it has a preset or pre-prepared volume of air to be delivered for every inspiration. Okay? So that's your volume cycled ventilators. When we say pressured cycle ventilators, it delivers flow of air, inspiration, until it reaches a preset pressure and then the cycles off and expiration occurs. That means it gives a preset uh, pressure, okay? It delivers a flow of air to the patient gradually until it reach the preset or the predetermined pressure. Once that preset pressure has been reached, then expiration will occur. We also have your high frequency oscillatory support ventilators. It delivers very high respiratory rates such as between 180 to 900 breaths per minute that are accompanied by very low tidal volume and high airway pressures. So it is indicated for opening the, the closed small airway such as your atelectasis and your ARDS or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So it is given in a very high respiratory rates because it needs to force the closed small airways to open. Okay, so this is how your high frequency oscillatory support ventilators work. Now we have your non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. It is a method of positive pressure ventilation that can be given via face mask or other oral or nasal devices. And it eliminates the need for in the tracheal tube intubation or tracheostomy. Most commonly, uh, sorry, most comfortable mode in pressure control press, uh, ventilation with pressure support, okay? Since we will not be using ET tube here or tracheostomy, so it's more comfortable mode or way of a pressure controlled ventilation. Now let's proceed to the continuous positive airway pressure or your CPAP. It provides positive pressure to the airways throughout the respiratory cycle. It is most effective treatment for obstructive sleep apnea 
because the positive pressure acts as a splint keeping the upper airway and trachea open during the sleep. To use CPAP, the patient must be breathing independently. Another one is your bi-level positive airway pressure or your BiPAP. It offers independent control of inspiratory and expiratory pressures while providing pressure support ventilation. Mostly used for patients who require ventilatory assistance at night. For example, your severe COPD or sleep apnea. We also have here different ventilator modes. This refers to how breaths are delivered to the patient. So the commonly used modes are continuous mandatory ventilation or your CMV. We also have your assist control, AC. Intermittent mandatory ventilation, IND and synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, SIMV, pressure support ventilation, your PSV, and airway pressure release ventilation, APRV. As you notice, these modes can be seen on your, on your mechanical ventilators, okay? So if you happen to have your clinical duty at the hospital, and you have a patients, uh, patients who are intubated, so you would notice on their uh, mechanical ventilator these following modes. So let's discuss each. For your continuous mandatory ventilation or your CMV, it provides full ventilatory support by delivering a preset tidal volume and respiratory rate, and it is indicated for apneic patients. So we use this mode for patients who could not really produce or perform uh, breathing, okay? So they could not breathe independently. So this is a full ventilatory support mode. So the machine will, uh, will give them or will support them in terms of their ventilation, okay? For your assist control or AC ventilation, it is similar to CNV, okay? However, if patient initiates a breath between the machine's breath, the ventilator delivers at the preset volume. So this is your assisted breath. So in your assist control ventilation, the patient can somehow breathe partially. But still, the machine will give its preset volume of air to be introduced by, to the patient, okay? So it is called as an assisted breath, okay? Now we have your intermittent mandatory ventilation or your INV. It provides a combination of mechanical assisted breaths and spontaneous breath. So that means the patient here has a spontaneous breathing and sometimes the machine assists that breathing, okay? So they work hand in hand in order to fill in the required uh, oxygen of the patient. For your synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation or your SIMV, it delivers a preset tidal volume and the number of breaths per minute. The patient can breathe spontaneously with no assistance from the ventilator on those extra breaths. Okay, so on this uh, kind of uh, mode, the patient can now spontaneously breathe, okay? So when the patient spontaneously breathe, the ventilators will automatically stop to give extra or preset volume of air, okay? So in the event that the patient has no spontaneous breathing for the moment, so the ventilator will produce a, will produce a pressure 
volume of air to be delivered to the patient. Okay, so it means it synchronizes to the breathing patterns of the patient. We also have your pressure support ventilation. It applies a pressure plateau to the airway throughout the pre a patient triggered inspiration to decrease resistance within the tracheal tube and ventilator tubings. Pressure support is reduced gradually as the patient's strength increases. Okay. So your pressure support ventilation, it is the amount of air that is being uh, that is being retained to the lungs in order to prevent a uh, lung collapse okay in order to prevent an abrupt uh, an abrupt change on the pressure so it needs a uh, pressure support okay in order to maintain the integrity of your airways okay so that it would not abruptly collapse on uh, in a particular situation so we also have your airway pressure release ventilation or your APRV it is a time triggered pressure limited time cycle mode of mechanical ventilation that allows unrestricted spontaneous breathing throughout the ventilatory cycle We also have your Proportional Assist Ventilation, or your PAV. It provides partial ventilatory support in which the ventilator generates pressure in proportion to the patient's inspiratory efforts. So that means the assistance given by the ventilator should be in proportionate with the capacity of or the inspiratory efforts of the patient. For the nursing interventions, we have, first, we have to enhance gas exchange. We have also to promote effective airway clearance. We also have to prevent trauma and infection, and also promote optimal level of mobility. We have to promote optimal communication, coping ability. Also, we have to monitor and manage potential complications and promote home and community-based care. Now let's proceed to respiratory weaning. That means we, need, we are weaning the patient from the mechanical ventilator to a less sophisticated device, of, uh, in, device in delivering oxygen therapy. So it is the process of withdrawing the patient from dependence on the ventilator and it takes uh, place in three stages. So we have the removal from the ventilator, then after that, removal from the ET tube, then from the oxygen. Okay. So we also have criteria for weaning. So first, we have to make sure that the patient has stable vital signs. ABGs are within normal limits. We also have the winning indices. So that means the these are the criteria set in order to win the patient from the ventilator. Okay. So for your VC, we have 10 to 15 ml per kilogram. For your MIP, it should be at least negative 20 to a negative 20 centimeters of water. And for the um, minute ventilator, we have your six liters per minute. It, the patient's uh, rapid shallow breathing indices should be below 100 breaths per minute per liter. And the partial oxygen should be more than 60 millimeters of mercury. With fraction of inspired oxygen or your FiO2 less than 40%. Now let's discuss about chest drainage system. So it is a crucial intervention for improving gas exchange 
and breathing in the in post-operative period. It is used to re-expand the involved lung and to remove excess air, fluid, and blood. It is also used to treat spontaneous pneumothorax and trauma resulting in pneumothorax. We have here types of chest drainage system. First, we have your traditional water seal. We have your dry suction water seal and your dry suction. For your traditional water seal, it is also referred to as wet suction. Intermittent bubbling indicates that the system is functioning properly and it has three chambers, a collection chamber, a water sealed chamber which is in the middle and a wet suction control chamber. So this is your traditional water seal drainage system looks like. So we have three chambers, the collection chamber, the water seal, and the wet suction control chamber. Now we also have your dry suction water seal, also referred to as dry suction. And it has an indicator to signify that the suction pressure is adequate. The suction pressure is set with the regulator. And also it has three chambers, a collection chamber, a water sealed chamber at the middle and wet control suction chamber. So this is an example of your dry suction water seal system. Now let's have your dry suction, also referred to as one-way valve system. It has one-way mechanical valve that allows air to leak the chest and prevents air from moving back into the chest. It works even if knocked over, making it ideal for patients who are ambulatory. So this is an example of your dry suction or one-way valve system. So it is a handy valve. So it can be clipped in your dress. Okay. So you could actually wear this one while ambulating or going somewhere, okay? So no need to fill suction chamber with fluid, okay? So there's no need for water sealed or any uh, water to refill on the device. So ideal for ambulatory patient. So for our post-op nursing management, since this uh, chest tube or drainage chest drainage system is being done uh, at the operating room so after the installation or after the attachment of this chest tube to our patient we should have our post operative nursing management so first we have to monitor respiratory and cardiovascular status so vital signs taking is very important. We also have to improve gas exchange and breathing, improving airway clearance, and relieving pain and discomfort. Since this is a surgery, so pain is expected to our patient. So we have to manage the pain and discomfort of our patient. We also have to promote mobility and shoulder ex exercise okay, to prevent uh, pneumonia or any complication related to immobility. We also have to maintain fluid volume and nutrition and monitor and, monitor and manage potential complications. And lastly, we have to promote home and community-based care for or in preparation for the discharge of the patient. So I believe this is the end of my lecture discussion on the respiratory care modalities related to your gas exchange and respiratory function. So thank you so much for listening. I hope 
you learned something today. If you have any questions or clarification, you may comment down below. I'll be glad to read those questions and answer them. Also, if you like this YouTube channel, please click the like, share, and subscribe button and also hit the notification bell to keep you updated for new video uploads. This has been Crazy Nurse RN Hub. Have a good day.